at ease, soldiers. I've received instructions from our commander. We've been sent into battle. There's evidence that our enemy has infiltrated homes, schools, businesses, and even churches. He has attacked many and caused damage to the hearts of millions. Some believe that things have gone too far, that the enemy has taken too much territory, that there is nothing we can do. But we know differently. We know he can be defeated. And we have a plan. Your mission is called Operation J-12, code name 12 Ops. You are to win three people to our side and send those three as trained soldiers into the battlefield to win three and send three as well. As each of us wins three and sends three, we'll wipe our enemy out and we'll restore what he has destroyed. The mission is clear. We cannot fail. We will not fail. Now, move out. Father God, we humbly come before you to carry out your purpose. We go forth in the knowledge that it is not by our might, but by your anointing that we are able to stand against the enemy. We put on the whole armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the belt of truth, and our feet is shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And our mouth is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. For we fight not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness. In faith, we are armed with spiritual armor to save our world. In Jesus' name, we pray as we march on the winning side. Amen. So open your Bible to Mark chapter 5, and let's talk about our mission today. Mark chapter 5. The title of our message is Save Your World. Save Your World. Now here in Mark chapter 5, we have a story of a man who was possessed with a legion of demon spirits. The Bible teaches that the man was so demon possessed, he had supernatural power, supernatural strength. When they tried to bind him with fetters, and chains, he just broke them off. And the man was so possessed that he was greatly tortured. The Bible said he lived among tombs, and you know, during the day he'd go into the mountains and they'd hear him crying and cutting himself with stones. Well, one day Jesus arrived on the shore, and this man came running to Jesus, and Jesus cast those demons out of that man. And the Bible teaches that when the people from the town came out to see Jesus, they found the man sitting there clothed and, and in his right mind. Believe it or not, those people then asked Jesus to leave. And, you know, God won't force himself on you, so Jesus went ahead and got in the boat. But this man begged Jesus that he could go with him. And we have here in Mark chapter 5 and verse 19, one of the few places in the Bible where Jesus told somebody, no. Verse 19 reads in this way, how be it Jesus suffered, or today we would say allowed him not. In other words, he said no. Why? But saith to him, go home to your friends and tell them how great things the Lord have done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. So notice that Although this man was now clothed and in his right mind, Jesus wasn't satisfied. Jesus now recognized that this man also had friends and family members, if you study it out, that were in a similar position to what he was in. Maybe they weren't possessed with a legion of demon spirits, but, at the, but they were tortured. They were lost. And Jesus gave this new Christian a mission. And the mission was to go tell his story, to go tell what Jesus had done for him, to go tell his family and friends about Jesus being the Lord, to go tell them ultimately that what Jesus did for him, Jesus would do for them. Well, there's so many of us in here today that have loved ones that don't know Jesus, 
loved ones that we care about. That's why we call them loved ones. That we know that if they were to die right now, they would go to hell. And the reason why God didn't just beam you up to heaven the minute you receive Jesus as Lord of your life is because God needs your help to reach the people that you care about because he loves them even more than you do. God sees that although you may be clothed and in your right mind now because you've received Jesus, that they are not and that they need him and that the person who is best equipped to reach them is you. And so he has given you a mission as well. He has given you an assignment as well, and it's to tell them your story. It's to tell them about Jesus. It's to tell them that what Jesus did for you, Jesus will do for them. God has given us an assignment, an assignment to win them and then ultimately to send them. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 11. When it comes to the topic of Jesus, you don't have the right to remain silent. You have an assignment to tell them about the Jesus that saved you, the Jesus that healed you, the Jesus that restored you, the Jesus that gave you a great life and has for you an amazing future. You got to tell them. Turn up and tell them, tell them. It's a crime for you to keep your mouth closed about the one you found that has done so much for you and is willing to do so much for them. You got to tell them. Turn somebody out. Tell them. Tell them. Yeah. That is our assignment. Look at Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30. It reads, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Why is this in the Bible? Because God wants us to be the one who win souls, who, who tell, tell people about Jesus and then help them come on over to team Jesus, over to God's side by receiving Jesus. Go to Daniel chapter 12. You know, last week we talked about how we're supposed to seek first the kingdom of God. And we learned that one of the ways we seek first the kingdom of God is by carrying out the assignment God's given us in the workplace. But I can tell you that the number one way you seek first the kingdom of God is by going forth and winning people to Jesus, by doing it yourself, not just helping somebody else do it, but actually doing it yourself. Because the bottom line is the, the people you already have a relationship with are the ones you are most likely to impact. You'll have a greater impact on them than any preacher, any other person that you may help or support. God needs you to carry out your assignment. Look at Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. It says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Once again, why is this in the Bible? Because God wants you to be one of those that turns many people to righteousness. God wants you to not just really win one, but win two and win three and, and on and on and on to turn them to God so they can have the future God wants them to have. And that is our assignment. Go to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. In verse 19, notice what Jesus says here. Of course, this applies to all Christians. He says, go ye, not just send somebody, not just serve and help somebody. You go. It's your mission, your assignment. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations. We know that this word teach means to make disciples. And as we mentioned earlier in the service, there is a difference between a convert and a disciple. There's a difference between someone who has been one and someone that is now a disciple for Jesus. And God has given us the assignment of not just winning them, as we just finished looking at, but also connecting new believers, growing new believers, and then sending them so they can go win people and, and send people as well. In fact, go to John chapter 15. I know we're looking at a lot of scripture, but this is word of faith. I don't know what church you thought you came to, but if you, if you were confused, now you know. Because this is what we do. 
Why are you going to turn to the neighbor? Tell them, save your world. Save your world. Turn to the other neighbor. Tell them, save your world. Save your world. Find one more person. Tell them, save your world. Save your world. Find one more person and tell them, they need you. Yeah, your brothers and sisters and parents and cousins and colleagues and your friends, they need you to win them and send them to save your world. John 15, verse 2, notice what the Bible says even about new Christians. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Of course, if you perceive Jesus, you're in him, but notice he expects us to produce fruit. So that new believer is in him, but now God says they need to produce fruit. In fact, notice the second half of the scripture, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. So God is saying everybody who is in, in Jesus, everyone who's on his team is expected to produce fruit for him. And the fruit, the number one fruit we produce is other people who have now received Jesus. In fact, notice verse 8. He says, herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit fruit. So, another way of saying it is, then shall you be my disciples. So when someone you've won to Jesus has now gone forth and they have won somebody else to Jesus, that's when Jesus says, that's a disciple. So it's not just our assignment to win people, but it's our assignment to send people. And this series that we're beginning today is a series to help you do both because we've learned that when you save a soul, when you, win, when you save a soul or win a soul, you save a life. But when you make them a disciple, you save your world. And so for the next couple of weeks, our goal is going to be to teach you how to make disciples, to, to help you to, to complete Operation J-12, as we call it, to help you to get to a place where you're winning three and sending three and, and they're winning three and sending three, to help you get to a place where you're taking a part of this movement that I believe God is birthing here today so that we can save Detroit, we can save our country, and we can save our world. So go with me to Mark chapter 1, and now let's get into what we're supposed to talk about today. That was just the introduction. Oh, glory to God. <laughs> Mark chapter 1. Now, winning three and sending three starts by winning one. Right? We win people to Christ one person at a time. And so I want to start by just talking about something today that that will help us to win, just that one person to Christ. And, and, and today we're going to kind of give you the foundation that you need, and then next week we'll get into some of the specifics of how to do it, and we'll go from there. So let's start in Mark chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 35, but just to give you an idea of the context, uh, Jesus has come to Capernaum, and he is staying in Peter's Peter's house. And the Bible teaches that that the, the town around them, all of Capernaum, brought to Peter's house everybody that they had in their family, everyone they knew that was sick or possessed with a with demon spirit. And so the Bible teaches that Jesus then went out and ministered to every single one of them, laid hands on every one of them, Luke chapter 4 talks about, and he got everybody healed, got everybody delivered. And then, of course, uh, you know, that was the end of that day of ministry. Well, I can tell you something about ministering. Uh, I, I've seen information that's, that, that lets you know that preaching a one-hour message like I'm doing now is, is, the, is the equivalent of working an eight-hour day to your body. I can tell you that from experience, that that's true. And, and, and when you, on top of preaching, then lay hands on person after person after person after person after person and lay and, you know, cast out devils and all that stuff, that takes even more out of you. So, you know, I know for me, Monday is a day where I just have to recuperate. You know, and it's the day that, you know, don't call me and ask me about, you know, what the Bible say in Jude chapter 1. <laughs> Read your Bible yourself. Leave me alone. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it is, it's a challenge, right? So you, you would think that after a day of ministry like Jesus just had, that, you know, he would he'd be sleeping in, he'd go on vacation or something. But notice what he did, does in verse 35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, Mm. (laughs) 
Now, to us, the way we talk today, morning and day are the same thing, but it wasn't, that's, that's not how they viewed it. And so really, morning was from like 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., and day was from 6 a.m. on. So Jesus got up somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. You know, Jesus was the most disciplined person of all time, which is why he was the most successful of all time. But here he is. He gets up between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., and then the Bible says he went out. So, you know, today we'd say he got to brush his teeth, wash his face, took a shower, whatever. Then he left the house and departed into a solitary place to be alone. Well, what was so important that he had to get up that early and then had to leave the house so he could be alone and there prayed. He prayed. He got to that solitary place so that, and, and then when he got there, he spent time talking to God. That's what prayer simply is, just talking to God. You talking to God, God talking to you. And he spent time in prayer, and we don't know. He could have spent up to three hours in prayer, spending time, you know, in, in, you know, three hours talking to God and having God talk to him. Well, I want you to notice something about what Jesus did here then. Uh, Jesus got up early and traveled to another location to pray because he clearly felt that prayer was valuable. I mean, come on, you don't just get up early and, 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 you know, and go through the things he went through if you, don't, if you don't think much of what you're about to do. In fact, you know, my, my father, as many of you know, he likes to hunt and he doesn't do it as much as he used to. But, you know, I would go with him sometimes, but, you know, he loved to hunt. I liked to hunt. You know what I mean? It wasn't the end of the world for me. Give me a basketball. I love to do that, you know. And, and, and I think the last time I went hunting, and it may not be a, a coincidence that this was the last time. <laughs> one, one of the things I don't like about hunting and is, is, is that, you know, you got to get up before the animals are really up. You're supposed to be up and in the stand before they start moving. So, you know, I'm not a morning person. <laughs> Come on, anybody here not a morning person? In my household, there's three morning people and then two not-so-morning people. I'm one of the two that's not a morning. So I don't even like getting up early unless I have to. But on, the last time I went hunting with my dad, it was here in Michigan. And, um, and it was cold. <laughs> and here we are getting up at 5 in the morning or something, and I'm getting out here, get, sitting in this stand, freezing. And, of course, you can't move. You can't do anything because you could scare off the animals. And, and I sat there, and I froze and, 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 and froze and never saw a thing. <laughs> I haven't been hunting since. I've had some fun with it, but you get my point. I mean, for me, to get up that early, it, it, it better be something I love. <laughs> you know, I played basketball in college. We had practice at five in the morning. Didn't bother me as much, you know. Well, notice Jesus felt that this was something that was that important. It was that important to him that even after the day he had, bef the day before, and however tired he might have been, that he got up early and went out and spent time in prayer. He felt prayer was that valuable, that important. And notice uh, a little bit more why, we can see some, a little, little, little bit more information on why he felt that way. If you jump down to, well, let's pick up with verse 36. It says, And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. Well, in my Bible, I actually drew a line between the word prayed in verse 35 and the word preach in verse 38. Because Jesus understood that it was important for him to pray before he preached. And one of the things that I've learned being in ministry and, and watching, whether it's Bishop Butler or Brother Hagan, or reading about, you know, or listening to David Yonggi's show and other great, you know, men of God who've done, done a lot of things for God, is that, you know, you don't get up and preach without having spent some time in prayer. You know, you, you, and... and uh, and you're spending that time in prayer, believing that that time in prayer is that through your prayer, God is preparing the hearts of the people to hear the word. 
I mean, really what's happening is that it's like if you're trying to sow a seed, you got to get the conditions just right. That's what's happening. You're praying so the conditions are just right, so people's hearts are just in the, posi- the right position so they can receive the seed of the word. And if you do that, you pray, you pray through on that, you complete your prayer assignment, then what will happen is you'll be successful in carrying out your mission. If you don't, you won't. Uh, I remember hearing Dr. David Young Cho, who was the pastor of the Lord, world's largest church. Now, now, now he's not pastoring anymore. He's kind of semi-retired. But when he started, that church had, I don't know, 10 people or something like that. And when he ended, he had 800,000 members. And, and he talked about the fact that uh, he found that where he preached had an impact on how much God required him to pray before he preached. He said he'd come to America, he'd only have to pray an hour and a half, two hours before he preached because that would be all it took for people's hearts to be ready. But then he said he'd go to Europe and he had to pray four hours or Japan. And the reason is because the, the, the condition of the hearts of people there. Well, the point is that when, when, when Jesus would go to pray, and he was going to pray in Mark chapter 1, before he went to preach, what he was doing was praying so that God could deal with the hearts of those people so they could have the best opportunity to receive what he had to say, to receive the, a life-changing word. And we have to do the exact same thing. There is somebody in your life right now that God wants you to win to him. There's somebody in your life that God may be dealing with you as I'm talking about, talking to you. And it's time to win them now. It's it's, it's no longer time to say, well, one of these days. No, no, the reason why God's having us do this series right now, because I didn't just just decide we're going to do this right now. The reason God's having us do this is because it is time for you to win them. But before you can win them, you have to tell you have to start this process by praying for them. You have to understand what Jesus understood that every success is a prayer success first. Go with me to Galatians chapter 4. And we all understand that if, if you are going in for a job interview that you've been believing God for, that you need to brush your teeth that day. Come on, wash your face. Do your hair. Put on something nice. We call that dressing for success. Right? Well, you got to do the same thing spiritually. Before you talk about winning somebody that you care about to Jesus, you got to pray for success. You got to spend time in prayer so that God can prepare their heart so they're ready to receive the good news about Jesus and make the best decision of their life to receive him. Well, let's look at Galatians chapter 4 and learn a little bit more about that type of prayer, what type of prayer we need to be praying. Now, here in Galatians chapter 4, Paul's talking about the, the church of Galatia. They've kind of, they were Christians, but they allowed someone to trick them into thinking that although they received Jesus, they still had to follow the law. So Paul wrote the entire letter addressing this issue. And I want you to know something he said in verse 19. My little children, of course, he was their spiritual father, and they were still baby Christians. It's one reason why they were so easily tricked. Of whom, or we might say for whom, I get this, travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. In other words, until you mature. Well, notice the terminology he used. He says, I have been travailing in birth. I travailed in birth again for you, which implies that there was a first time he did it. And the first time he did it was when he went to Galatia for the first time and got ready to preach to them. He travailed in birth so that they would be ready to receive the message, and they did. They got saved. But notice again the terminology he uses travail in birth. Now, you know, this, this phrase literally refers to, uh, it's like a woman who's in childbirth. And I think it's very clear, and if we have time, maybe I'll show you, but I think it's very clear that he was referring to prayer. He said this is a different type of prayer than, you know, the prayer of faith, where you just go before God and say, Father, I ask you for this, and I believe I receive it, I thank you I got it, and that's it. No, this is the type of prayer where, you, where it's a process where you're giving birth to something. And in this case, you're giving birth to somebody else's blessing. 
In fact, go, go with me to a couple places. Go to Colossians chapter 4. Let me prove that to you. Colossians chapter 4. Every success is a prayer success first. But what kind of prayer? How should we be praying for the, that individual? You know, if there's a Dave in your life that you believe God wants you to win, or, you know, or Maria, whatever name it is, how, how do I pray for them? Because you clearly should pray for them. Well, Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. We're just proving what that travail and birth even refers to prayer. I mean, as I was meditating on that, it dawned on me, well, what else could it mean? It didn't mean Paul was in the hospital giving birth. And it didn't mean he was worrying about them. The Bible clearly teaches. Paul teaches not to do that. So it's referring to this. Colossians 4, 12, it says, Epaphras, who was one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you, always laboring fervently. Did you see that? Labor. Laboring fervently for you. How? In prayers. That you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Notice what, how he's saying Epaphras was the minister who was assigned to this church, the church of Colossae. And Epaphras was someone who was laboring fervently in prayer for them. He was travailing in birth in prayer for them so they could also be mature spiritually. Go to Romans chapter 15. Romans 15 and verse 30. Just notice the language that's used to describe this type of prayer. It reads, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Strive. Sounds like you're fighting. And the Bible does teach us that we are in a war. You know, we, we are soldiers. We are fighting against not flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness and heavenly places. In other words, we're fighting against the forces of Satan. We're to put on our armor. And then once we have our armor on, we're to pray. But notice once again that, that he's talking about the same type of prayer, whether he calls it travailing in birth or laboring fervently or striving. He's talking about a prayer that we commonly call the prayer of supplication. A heartfelt, earnest prayer that is more like a process than an event. This is the type of prayer where I'm going to pray for this person. I may pray for them for an hour, praying particularly in, in, in other tongues for them. And, and I may end up being, doing this, you know, a couple of days a week for a couple of months or whenever until the Lord releases me in my heart that my mission has been accomplished, my prayer mission. And then at that point, I can go ahead and start doing the real mission of winning them. Many times. You know, when we talk about praying this type of prayer, it, it, it's a little strange to some of us because we don't really pray this type of prayer for other people. In fact, some people say, well, I don't even know how to pray that type of prayer. Well, you know, honestly, I think you do. Because anytime you're in trouble, you know how to pray a heartfelt, earnest prayer. <laughs> Come on. You don't, you don't start off with, Lord, I, you know, I need to know you. Lord! Do something now. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, we know how to pray a heartfelt, earnest prayer when we're in trouble. We need God to do something. And, and what we need to understand is that if we are, will pray that type of prayer for ourselves, we surely ought to pray that type of prayer for somebody that we care about. Listen, even if you're dealing with something now, at least if you're a believer, you've received Jesus, you're going to heaven. But if they haven't, they haven't even received Jesus, right now they're going to hell. And whether or not they hear the message about Jesus the way they need to hear it or the way they need to receive it is partly dependent on your prayers. You know, life's not about you. Ultimately, life is about you helping other people. So if you're willing to pray fervently for yourself, you surely ought to pray fervently for the people you care about so heaven will be their home. And it's this type of prayer that we have got to pray for them because it prepares their hearts to receive. Well, let me tell you a few more things about how we can pray for them. Go to Colossians chapter 4. Every success is a prayer success first. 
If you're going to win someone in Jesus, it starts with prayer. Heartfelt, fervent prayer. Praying in the Spirit. And if you're somebody giving God an hour a day in prayer, every, you know, then you know, take, take one of those days and just pray for that person. Let God lead and guide you about how to pray for them. But let, let me say this about prayer, by the way. You know, you're going to have a hard time doing this type of prayer if you start trying to pray in bed. <laughs> Come on, anybody been guilty of that? You wake up, it's kind of cold outside. You're like, oh, it's kind of cold. I'm just going to just stay in the bed and pray. <laughs> Father, in Jesus' name, I don't and that bro, and that, and that. Oh, oh, bread, they yeah, start throwing na 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 na. Then you look at the clock. Oh, it's been an hour. I guess I, I finished my prayer time. No, you prayed about ten minutes, and you slept fifty minutes. Somebody might even say I had a vision during prayer. No, you had a dream during prayer. That's what happened. That wasn't even prayer. You had a dream while you were sleeping when you're supposed to be praying. No, you got to get up. With, you may not have to get up and leave your house. But you need to get up and get to a solitary place. Because thank God for praying in tongues or when you're driving the car, or, you know, when you're at the gym. All that stuff is great. You're building yourself up. Nothing wrong with doing that. But you need time where you get away from everything else and God gets your full attention every day. Mature Christians do that. Babies don't. And you notice Jesus' is life. Jesus consistently would get away and pray. And it was after he did that that he had his greatest uh, moments of power. I mean, you, when we read about Jesus walking on the water, sometimes we miss that what he was doing before he walked on the water was that he spent all night in prayer in a mountain by himself. He didn't even let the apostles stay around. He sent them out so I can go by myself and spend time with God. Then he came down in power and walked on the water. Some folk want to walk on the water. They ain't even seen Jesus' face for a month. You know what I'm saying? They haven't spent any time in prayer. No, you got you to have the time with God. You got to spend time with God. You got to, not just for yourself, but you got to do it for your family. You got to do it for your kids. If you're married, for your mate, even if they do know Jesus, and surely for people in your life that don't know him. Because your prayer is going to be what, what prepares the way for God to really reach their hearts. And for them to stop being the person in the mountains crying and cutting themselves with stones. Well, Colossians chapter 4, learn a little bit more about how we can pray for them. Every success is a what success? Prayer. A prayer success first. Colossians 4 verse 3. With all praying also for us, that God would open to us a door of utterance. The word utterance means speech or preaching to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. Well, isn't that strange that Paul is saying, pray for us so that we can have opportunity to preach? I mean, you would think that, hey, Paul, you can, you can make opportunity to preach anytime you want. Just walk with it, go somewhere where people are and start preaching. But if you, if you understand these things, you, you get what he's saying. Listen, just because you happen to be around somebody that doesn't know Jesus, doesn't mean that you're immediately supposed to preach a three-point sermon to them. You need God to open a door of opportunity to minister to them. And this is especially true with family. We understand this with family. We understand even in the natural that there's a time to go to your husband or your wife or your father or whatever with something, and there's a time not to. You ever heard, you ever said, oh, not a good time right? There's a time in the natural. And the same thing is true spiritually. There are times where, you know, this is just not a good time. They're not ready. And, 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 some, and there are times where, man, you know, God's really prepared their heart. They're ready. Let me talk to them right now. See, one of the things that's been declared this year is that this is a year of great opportunity. And, you know, we're shouting about that and we're thinking about that, but we're also thinking about it, many of us, in terms of opportunities for us to be blessed, when it's also a great year, a year of great opportunities for us to minister to the people that we've been wanting to minister to for years. But God's the one that opens those doors. God's the one that gets them to the place where they ask you the question. You're going, you ask me what? 
You don't even believe in God. How, what? God's the one that, that, you know, all of a sudden they're going through some marriage problems, and, yet, and yet you have been through those problems. And God gave you a victory, and then they come and tell you, this is what's going on in my life, and you go, hmm, God let you know, yeah, this is it. And you jump in and tell them what God did for you, and then you can tell them about the God who did it for you. God's the one that will open opportunities for you to minister to people, but that happens when you pray for it. Every success is a prayer of success first. So one of the things you want to pray is that God would open to you an opportunity to minister to them when they are ready to receive it. Go with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 4. What else can we pray for? Since we're praying for those we want to win to Jesus, what else should we pray? Acts chapter 4. Verse 29. Now, these individuals had just come from being threatened, told to not preach in the name of Jesus anymore. And they were threatened by the very people that sentenced Jesus to death. So how many know that's a real threat? Okay. But they know that they have a mission. And it's to, to win people to Jesus, to make disciples. So they go before God and they pray something that we ought to pray ourselves. In verse 29, they say, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all what? All boldness they may speak thy word. By, or as the Amplified Bible says, while you stretch forth your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. So they're praying for boldness. Now the Bible says the righteous are as bold as a lion. You know, because we know that we are right before God. We know God is with us, so who cares who's against us? We know we have the word of God, and we know we have the anointing of God, that really we already are bold. But we live in a time, even today, where telling somebody about Jesus is frowned upon. And you've seen this more so in the last four years than you have in, in probably in the history of this nation. And depending on what happens in this next year or so, any of these elections coming up, it may be a lot worse four years from now. It's gotten to the place where they're basically saying that your faith has no place in the public square. And for you to proselytize, as they call it, is a bad thing. And so people are afraid that if I tell somebody about Jesus, people are going to have a problem with me. People are going to talk about me. You know, I'm going to have other problems in my life. And so, you know, some people, what happens with some Christians is then we decide to go, we, we've allowed every nasty thing to come out the closet while we went in the closet. Yet the Bible says we are as bold as a lion, and we have an assignment, a mission as soldiers in the kingdom of God to go and tell people about Jesus. We can't hide from the battle. We can't run from the battlefield. We've got to go out and charge. So how do I get to a place where I deal with these feelings of, of, of fear and, and, and concern about, you know, what people are going to say and what they're going to think and whether or not they're going to reject me when, frankly, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting Jesus anyway. How do I get from there to the place where I'm boldly telling them about Jesus anyway? You pray for boldness. And when you pray for boldness, God will give you boldness. You'll be turning to another man. Look at verse 31. Remember these guys' situation. They know to preach means they may die. So they ask God to help them. And verse 31 says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with what? Boldness. Staying full of the Holy Ghost, praying every day will help you to do this. But notice that they prayed for boldness, and God gave them boldness. Pray that when you, God gives you opportunity to minister to somebody in your life, that you have the boldness boldness to step through that door and tell them what they need to hear about Jesus. Amen. Then one last one, go to Matthew chapter 9, and we'll go a different direction. Every success is a prayer success first. And that's true concerning winning your loved one or your friend. Matthew chapter 9, verse 38. 
Jesus just finished looking at multitudes of people who were, you know, beaten down and, and hurting. And he couldn't get all of them. And not in his physical body. And, and neither could his 12. So he said this in verse 38. He said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send for laborers into his harvest. In other words, pray that God will raise up and send out more people to go and win other people to Jesus. Well, here's something else that you can pray for. You know, first of all, you know, thank God that God has somebody pray you into the kingdom. I want to mention that real quickly. Anybody glad that God has somebody pray you in? And so you ought to do the same for other people. Pay it forward, right? And do it for God and do it for other people. But here's something else you can pray for them. And that is that God will send other people across their path to tell them about Jesus as well. In other words, not only are you someone that, that's there praying for them and ready to minister to them, but there's somebody else that is, maybe a couple people, so that God's got, you know, he's kind of tag teaming. You know, God's got three or four people that, 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 are, that, are, that are ministering to this person in different ways so that their heart is ready so that they can finally see the truth about Jesus and make a great decision about him. Now, this does not mean you abdicate responsibility for your part. What some people do is they say, well, Lord, I want you to, to save Johnny. And then they say, so, Lord, send laborers across this path. Well, thank God that God will send other laborers, but you're laborer number one. Right? So you ought to, first of all, be the one going out here to minister to them, but also believing God will send other people. Most people don't get saved just because one person talked to them. Most people, well, it, it, it's a process. And what happens is this person ministered to them. They saw how this person lived. This person ministered to them. A bad thing happened in their life. Finally, they, some people, they, they reached the place where they were just done. You know, like they, they did nothing else they could try, and God was able to get the word to them so they could see the answer. And so it may not be, you, you may not even be the one that witnesses or wins them, but you praying for them can lead to somebody else witnessing and somebody else witnessing and God doing this and God doing that till they get to that place where they have been won to Jesus and now a life has been saved. Now, go with me if you would to Judges chapter 16. I want to go a different direction with this. Every success is a prayer success first. So you've got to pray for these individuals. You've got to pray for whoever it is God's put on your heart. Praying in the spirit, because that's the main way we should do it. Praying in, in your understanding, just the prayers we talked about. And most of all, recognize you got to pray from your heart. You know, God is not really inter too interested in you just praying things by rote, just quoting some words. God answers prayers that come from the heart. But as you do that, God will prepare the way for individuals to be one to him, people that you care about. Now, having said that, I want to talk about something that can get in the way of your prayers working like they should. Can get in the way of your prayers accomplishing, let's put it that way, their purpose of those people's hearts being ready to receive. And so let's start here in Judges chapter 16 and verse 1. Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there a harlot and went in unto her. And it was told the, Ga the Ga Gazites, saying, Samson has come hither. And they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders and carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. Whoa. Did you, do you realize what you just read? I mean, some folks struggle to walk up to the top of the hill by themselves. <laughs> They're so out of shape. What do we have here? We have the strongest man in the history of the planet. His name was Samson. And Samson was God's judge called by God, anointed by God to deliver Israel from their enemies, the Philippines, the Philistines, excuse me. And, but Samson had a weakness, women. And so 
Uh, Samson here in, in Judges 16 goes into a city, sees a prostitute, and goes and sleeps with her. And his enemies find out he's there. They, they surround him. They say, in the morning, we're going to take him out. Samson gets up at midnight and, get this, is still anointed enough to go to the gate of the city and pick up the doors of the gate of the city and put him on his shoulders and march up the hill. Now, I want you to notice something, how he was still anointed despite the fact he just finished sleeping with a prostitute. Some people say, you know, well, I, I don't understand how that can be. Well, you know, frankly, God is a merciful God. Anybody glad God's merciful? And so, you know, sometimes we think, well, if you mess up, you know, immediately you're going to get judged and immediately you lose the anointing. Well, thank God that didn't always happen. But the other side of that issue is that if you continue to mess up, you will end up like Samson did with your eyes plucked out. Mm. Some of y'all looking at me like, I didn't want to hear that. <laughs> well, you at the right place at the right time then. Verse 4. And it came to pass afterward that he loved the woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Now, let me tell you, he was in a place he had no business being. He didn't be in enemy territory for any other reason but de defeating the enemy. And he's messing with a woman he had no business man, be messing with. She was not an Israelite woman. She, he should not have been with her according to the law that he lived under. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And we will give thee every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. So notice that the lords of the Philistines sent a woman to do what a man couldn't. Okay. They've tried to kill him over and over again. He's, one time he beat up t a thousand men, killed a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. He didn't have a machine gun or nothing. Just tore them up. They can't stop him. They realize, let's send the woman to do the job. They tell the woman, entice him, find out what the secret is of his strength, which tells me something about Samson. If, if, Sam, they, if they felt like there was a secret to his strength, it wasn't apparent which means he couldn't have been ridiculously huge. You know, I mean, even then, his strength was incredible. But he, I don't get the impression that Samson was this big monster walking around and using under how is he so strong. Duh. Amen. You know, no, there was a secret here. They wanted to know what the secret was. They wanted to know how we can defeat him. And they said, we will give you 1,100 pieces of silver each. So this is the original gold digger. Oh. <laughs> well, she's about to get paid. And I'm going to tell you something, she worked hard for her money. <laughs> so you know the story. You know, she, she comes to Samson and she says to him, you know, hey, if you love me, tell me the, your secret. You know, you, and I can see how this went down. If you really love me, if you really trusted me, <laughs> If I was different than all the other women, then you would tell me your secret. So here she comes, and he tells her one thing, he lies to her. Then she tries it, you know, and, and he, he sleep. she tries it, and then she says, the Philistines are on us, and the Philistines are in her house. He wakes up, defeats the Philistines. She says, you lied to me. <laughs> tell me what it is. So he tells her something else. She tries it again. You know, wakes him up. The Philistines are on you. Philistines are in the house again. You think at some point he figures something out. <laughs> this is something about being in love that can make you stupid. <laughs> Which is why you do need to have some people around you that know something about God and God's way of doing things so that they can talk to you because that person... You know, they can see that this guy's got two horns, a tail, and a staff. 
and they can see he's the devil, but all you see is an angel. You need people around you that can let you know, no, that's the devil. So you don't get your eyes plucked out. But she does it again. He wakes up, defeats the Philistines. A third time, she says, you know, what is your secret? He says, you got to do something with my hair. She, he wakes up, she's done his hair, like he said. Once again, he goes out, defeats the Philistines, and finally, she says, you don't love me. If you love me, you tell me the truth. And the Bible says he, she came after him day after day after day after day until he was weary to a place that his soul was vexed to death. Read, you read it. She wore him down. Finally, he said, this is what the secret is. I've been a Nazarite under God my whole life. There's a vow that I follow, and my hair cannot be cut. She realizes he told her. He told her everything. She calls for the lords of the Philistines. They come down with the money. And while she gets him to sleep on her lap, she gets his hair cut. You get to verse 20. Verse, excuse me. Yeah, that's, that's right, verse 20. And she said, the Philistines be on you, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself couple things there. So he's saying, I'm just going to go do what I've done before. And then I love how he says, I'm going to shake myself. That, if you set it out, it, it, it refers to like how a lion shakes his mane. It seems like maybe that was the way he would activate the anointing. He'd get out and shake himself, and then he'd tear folk up. But this time, the Bible said, he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. He didn't know that he didn't have the Lord with him. He didn't have that anointing, which tells me that this was not an anointing he could feel. All this time when he's killing, you know, a lion comes out and he attacks a lion, kills a lion, and kills a thousand men, and does all, you know, picks up doors. He never, he couldn't feel the anointing. He did all that by faith. He just stepped out knowing that God's power was on him, and he stepped out believing God would back him up. Except this time, he is not about the hair. He's, he's violated the vow. He played around with sin too long. Come on now. Amen. Come on now. Amen. And he didn't even realize that it was judgment day. And that's how it happens. You don't realize it. You've been doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, bam. bam. He gets up and he's gone. He didn't have the anointing. And the Bible says in verse 21, the Philistines took him and put out his eyes. And brought him down to Gaza, bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. And I can tell you, I can imagine that they probably beat the world out of him first. This man has killed their brothers, their cousins, their sons, and here he is. And all of a sudden, you can get to him. They probably beat him to a pulp, and then they took his eyes out. This is life change because of his sin. Now, thank God, God's a God of mercy. Later on, he, 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 he repents before God. His hair grows back. God uses him to accomplish his mission. He kills all the Philistines in one fell swipe, but he dies in the process. If he hadn't have done this, he could have accomplished his mission. Lord knows how long he would have lived. Had family and all that stuff. But because of his sin, he paid a heavy price. And in his case, you know, he did finally accomplish his mission, but it was a lot harder than it would have been. We can see something about how Satan works here. Samson had God's anointing so he could complete the mission God gave him. Satan found, he realized the only way he was going to stop Samson from accomplishing that mission was to get that anointing. And he did. God has given you a mission to win your family and friends to Jesus, to send them out as disciples, not to mention the assignment he's given you in the workplace and all the other things we've been talking about. And there is nothing Satan can do to stop you unless he can get your anointing. So he comes after your anointing so that he can pluck your eyes out and keep you from accomplishing your mission. And he tried this with numerous people. He tried this with Jesus. When Jesus came out of the water after being water baptized, the anointing rested on him. God sent him into the wilderness to fast. And while he was there, Satan came and tempted him. 
And he was tempting him to get him to get into sin so he'd lose that anointing. Because if he'd lose that anointing, he couldn't accomplish his mission. We'd all go to hell. He did the same thing with Joseph. Joseph was a slave, but God's anointing was on him. And so Joseph was having success. And God's ultimate plan was for Joseph to be the prime minister of Egypt and to save his family. Satan said, I'm going to try to get this guy right off the top. He tries to get the guy to commit adultery. And, and his plan was to get that anointing because if he had committed that sin, he never would have been the prime minister of Egypt. But Joseph passed the test, and he became prime minister of Egypt. Well, here, I'm here to tell you, Satan's after your anointing. Some of you have been dealing with some, some seductress at the job. She is anti-Christ to you, anti-anointing. You need to treat her as such and get as far away as you can. Some of you have been financial. You know, you, whether you've had opportunities to cheat or lie or steal or whatever it is, whatever Satan is sending your way, you can't live your life living that sin. You can't live your life drinking alcohol. You can't live your life cussing all the time. You can't live your life getting bootleg cable, for goodness sake. You can't live your life doing what you know is wrong because you are costing yourself the anointing. And get this, if Satan can get your anointing, then he can stop your witness. Go to John 17. After you prayed for those individuals that we've been talking about, you've got to obey. After you pray, you've got to obey. You can't spend all this time praying for somebody. And then when they watch your life, they see you don't live your life any different than anybody else. I mean, you did all that time praying, and it was almost for nothing because they're, they're not receiving anything. John 17, verse 19, show you what I'm talking about. Notice something Jesus said. You all still with me? Yeah. We might as well back up to verse 18. He's talking about the 11. He says, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And we can say he sent us too now. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Well, notice what he said. He said, for their benefit, we'd say benefit. I sanctify, the word sanctify means to make holy. I made myself holy for their benefit. Now, there's a lot of reasons why we should live holy. You know, we've talked about a number of them here at Word of Faith in the last 30 years, I'm sure. But here's another one that maybe we don't think about right off the top of our heads. I mean, we don't think about it immediately. And that is that we ought to live holy because whether or not we live holy has an impact on whether or not somebody else will receive the truth about Jesus and then themselves live holy. I mean, we understand even in a home that if you have a parent or parents that went to college, you have a much better chance of their children going to college. Am I right? That doesn't mean that their parents didn't go, they couldn't go, but we know it means that they probably have a longer journey or it's a little bit more of a battle if, if no, in no other way mentally. But when you have an example... In front of you, there's power and an example. And, 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 and in fact, more power than we realize. And so, you know, if you have the right example in front of you, there's a much better chance that you're going to follow that example. You're going to do right. That's what Jesus understood. He's saying here, I'm living holy because me living holy will help them to live holy. And whether or not you live holy does have an impact on whether or not people you care about miss hell and go to heaven. It does. It just does. Sometimes we underestimate the power of an example. You know, that's why there's argument out here about, well, what I do in my bedroom is my business. You know, it had nothing to do with you. I'm sorry. That's just not true. We don't, you don't live in a vacuum. What you do affects me. What I do affects you, and it surely affects our children. Bottom line is, if you've got the wrong example in front of you, particularly when you see it, what happens is sin is contagious. It spreads. 
That's why the Bible said a little leaven leaven at the lump. You get one person among the group to ask a fool, and nothing's done about it, and another person to do it. Then another person to do it. Then, another, and then, all, 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 then everybody's doing it, and then you want to raise your righteous kid right in the middle of that. That's why Christians have such a problem with so many things that are being pushed out here because we're, we, we love the people that are being hurt and we don't want them hurt, but we also love our kids. And we don't want them seeing all that stuff, being surrounded by all that mess because we realize that that means that the greater chance they will do the same thing and end up in the same mess. Well, that, that principle applies here. If you are someone who is living a lifestyle that is not right according to the Bible because I am tired of Christians that call themselves Christians but sleep around, drink do all the other stuff and then want to be in the media talking about how I'm a Christian thinking it's okay to do both I've been trying to be nice all day and it, the nicest is wearing off No, if you live like that, you live that way, and they see you doing the exact same things they're doing, then there's no ch The chances of them hearing the words you have to say about needing and receiving Jesus are pff, almost non-existent. You smoke like I smoke. You drink like I drink. You sleep around like I sleep around. In fact, the bottom line is if you're a Christian and you decide you're going to live that life, you're going to actually be worse than them. Bible says you'll be worse. It would have been better if you had never known Jesus to then know Jesus and then go back and live that life. Now you're going you're gonna to find you'll be far worse. You, you know, where before maybe there were certain things you wouldn't do. This is a pluck your eyes out message for some folks today. It wasn't the plan, but it is. Come on, you ever notice how the good kids get in trouble, they say? You know, there's no way they're going to receive that word from you. And here's the other thing. There's a really good chance, since you call yourself a Christian and you don't live right, that even if another Christian comes to them, that, they, that what they have to say won't be heard because of what they see with you. That's why a lot of people don't go to church. Now, it's the lamest reason on earth. Well, I don't go, there's a whole bunch of hypocrites there. Well, why don't you join us, hypocrite, you know? I mean... <laughs> That's kind of a dumb example, dumb reason. But that's why they don't come, because some Christian didn't live the life, or some church didn't live the life. So my point is simply this. Every success is a prayer success first. So you've got to pray for these individuals, but you also need to live this life in front of them. Your life is the only Bible some people will ever read. You are the 67th book of the Bible to them. And if they will see in your life what God's Word says, that also will cause their hearts to still be open so that when the time comes for someone to tell them about Jesus, they will, have a, they will receive Him. Go to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to end here. Every success is a prayer success first. Whether or not you live holy will impact whether or not someone you care about will miss hell and go to heaven, whether they'll receive the word or not. Matthew 5 and verse 13, let me end here. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. What does salt do? It preserves. It saves. That's what you're supposed to do. But if the salt have lost its savor, it's lost its flavor, it's lost its anointing. Why? Because of sin. Wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing. Don't be a good for nothing Christian. but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men, to have his eyes plucked out. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men. Let your light shine. It's going to shine when you're living right. 
It's going to shine when you're doing good works. It's going to shine when you're telling them about the Jesus that did for you the things he's done for you. Why? That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. See, God's mission for us ultimately is to reveal his glory. We are his neon lights to the world. It's our goal to make Jesus famous. And when you spend time praying for people like we talked about, and then you live what we just read, God, people are going to, their hearts are going to be ready to receive the gospel. And because of what they've heard and what they've seen, you will have helped God win them to him. I want to encourage you today to, to this week, spend time praying for the person God's put in your heart. And make sure you're living what the word of God says and enjoy watching God impact their lives. Amen.